Hey folks, it's Eugene here and welcome to Click 3D. This is the program that is sort of like my accumulation of all kinds of 3D stuff. I do tutorial videos, I show new technologies, and I also do interviews with people. And that is in fact what I'm going to be doing today. I'm going to be interviewing John Chwalabog from Virtual Technology Simplified or VTS. And the reason is that they're doing some really cool stuff with iPhone LiDAR. And of course, many of you know that I also have a Recon 3D app, but I like talking to people in other areas that are doing similar things. Sometimes you'll find that you have many of the same problems and they're trying to achieve the same things. And sometimes there are some differences for sure, and you can learn from that as well. Now, I've known John for a very long time now while he was back in Pharaoh, but he's moved on. He started his new company and he's doing some really cool stuff. They're using the app for documenting things like utilities, but they also have a really cool portal where people can go in and they can view their scans, they can take measurements, they can do some really simple things and just keep everything organized and even share their data. So without further delay, let's get into it. And this is the interview with John Chwalabog from BTS. Okay, so first off, John, hey, thanks for being here today. Um, what I want to ask you first is about your background and, you know, where you came out of and how you kind of got into this area. So I, I, we know each other from the back in the day, like uh, with, with the Pharaoh days. So Pharaoh days, yeah, uh, yeah tell, me, tell me a little bit about your migration from, from that point onward. Yeah, well, it, it even started before then, um, you know, in, in the early 2000s, um, right, right around 2000, I joined Trimble. Um, I, I actually worked for Carl Zeiss, the geospatial uh, arm of, of Zeiss here in the U.S. Zeiss was acquired by Spectra Precision, which got acquired by Trimble. And so really started in the measurement space, geospatial measurement space uh, in, in the late 90s, survey equipment, um, uh, early days of 3D laser scanning, um, you know, measurement technologies, kind of newer technologies, new applications that evolved. Spent a number of years at Trimble, um, was on the product management side for a little while, um, channel um, development with, with some of the, the newer geospatial uh, technology, some of the mobile mapping stuff uh, that they were doing, trying to attach LiDAR and imagery to vehicles. Uh, from there, I went to Faro um, and, and worked uh, at Faro for a number of years. That's where we met, um, early days of 3D laser scanning with Faro. Um, and then I was fortunate enough to spend a little bit of time at Matterport, which is really an interesting uh, opportunity, you know, true Silicon Valley startup environment, you know, disrupting capture technology focused on real estate. They were trying to get into some other uh, areas and in, in industries. Um, and then that led me to starting VTS. Um, we started VTS in, in 2017 as really a reality capture services operation trying to bring technology to new industries, new users, kind of fill that gap of a technology uh, expert or team uh, for companies that were interested in using digital twins, but uh, weren't sure exactly which technology they needed to start with. Okay. And coming from Matterport, I mean, there, Matterport is really popular in the, in the real estate and like, there's a, I know a whole number of people in different fields that are using it. So when you started VTS, were you thinking about a specific industry or area or like how broad were you thinking no we we uh it's a great question we were actually uh, not sure um you know and and it probably delayed taking that leap of starting your own business um a, a little while because there were so many opportunities and interests a lot of new uh industries you know because of matterport and the visual tours and you know could we use it over here or not um, so when we started, we were doing scanning and capture for anyone and everyone. We, we captured helicopters. Uh, that was a really interesting, you know, use case. They were, it's a company refurbishing old military helicopters to reuse them and use them, put them into production. Um, so, so that kind of documentation, buildings, factories, you name it, we did it all. Um, over the course of kind of the first year of being in business, we kind of got pulled into uh, telecom and critical infrastructure. So um, just through some business relationships and contacts, uh, that industry was really adopting drone technology and they were trying to find some new uh, ways to complement uh, 3D capture with drones. And, and we really got pulled in that direction 
and ever since has been really focused on critical infrastructure and documenting that. Okay. So when, and when you started BTS, was it primarily laser scanners and drones? Yeah. Laser scan. Well, not even drones to begin with, primarily laser scanning. Um, you know, some imaging based stuff that was, you know, back, gosh, it's six, six years now. It seems like it was yesterday. Uh, but you know, imaging was a little bit newer, you know, Matterport was still uh, a little bit newer. So the idea of just kind of pure photogrammetry, um, and, and what kind of accuracy can you get out of that? The benefit of the, the imagery based stuff, you know, versus laser scanning or the combination of those things, the drone technology for us came on, you know, a, a year or two after that, um, just, just because of, um, the benefit that we saw. Um, you know, again, it's for us, it's always been about the toolbox and expanding the toolbox, not trying to replace one thing or another, you know, um, understanding the different technologies and applying them in the right way at the right time. So let me understand. So telecom, right? So you get, you get pulled into this, this telecom industry. So, and I always, I'm always curious about how people have been doing things before. So how was the telecom industry documenting, you know, this, this critical infrastructure and stuff like that before, or maybe even currently versus, you know, some of the things that you're doing today or, or what you're offering today? Yeah. It, uh, you know, and, and I don't, it, it's tough speaking kind of in general statements, but um, there, there was kind of this general uh, approach. And I think a lot of it was because of the fast paced change. The telecom technology was changing so fast. Um, there wasn't really great methodology to document the existing infrastructure. They were, you know, just continually moving through. Um, and so there's, there wasn't, and, and hasn't been historically a lot of great records uh, around what was there. The primary driver was to go out to a site, understand the existing infrastructure on that site because an upgrade was happening. So 4G to 5G is a, is a great example. What equipment's there? Uh, what other carriers might be on a site? You know, is there room on a rooftop or a tower to put additional equipment? Can we leverage some of that additional equipment? So it was really a true pre-construction kind of as-built documentation to understand the existing site to to drive that that um, change process, the the upgrade process. Um, with the, the adoption of drones and some of this digital twin technology, we're now starting to see, you know, the, the industry kind of have a database and maintain it and um, see, see that site change over time through the digital twin. But, but early on, it was, there really wasn't a lot of records of uh, what was on that existing site. So, I mean, you go in, you may do some big projects with the laser scanner and drones and things like that, but you also, well, we share something in common now and that we have a common app, uh, a, a mobile scanning app. And so I want to ask you about what sparked your interest in getting started with, you know, the mobile devices and what value that that brought to the telecom industry. There was a few, few key drivers, I think, you know, uh, laser scanning is, is, is great technology and, um, we weren't setting out to kind of replace that. Um, but there were some improvements that we were looking to, to make, you know, labor, labor has, has been a challenge finding good skilled people, you know, that understand 3d, um, you know, and, and can operate uh, a, a laser scanner correctly control, you know, I see the targets behind you, you know, some of that stuff um, to ensure really, you know, high quality data cost, you know, um, when we look at some of these projects, we're asked to to capture hundreds, if not thousands of sites across the country. And so how do you scale uh, when technology is very expensive? So that was a challenge for us. Um, and time, uh, time of capture, time on site. Um, we had very limited windows um, to get in and out of these these sites. And so we were trying to reduce the amount of time to capture. And so those kind of business drivers really started uh, or challenged us to look at new ways of capture, you know, and um, you know, like you said, we have a, a common core technology uh, in the app that we're using. We started to investigate that. Um, and we really focused on that user interface experience. So how can we get anyone who's visiting these sites to, you know, essentially leverage a, maybe a device in their pocket, 
a phone or an iPad. Um, and just like taking a video, you know, capture in 3D and get good enough three-dimensional information to understand the site. Yeah, I'm just looking at the video here that I'm, I'm playing from YouTube. So, um, you know, something like this with a mobile device, I mean, is this, I mean, has anyone ever made a comment about accuracy or, you know, whether or not this is not acceptable or is it good enough? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah I mean, it, it's... Um, the feedback from customers, it's 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 good enough. We we've actually had customers say like this is too much data. We don't need this these many points, um, which is awesome because you know you 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 know you can you can always decimate uh, information and kind of pare it back uh, to what they need. Um, we did a lot of testing, um, and I think you guys did as well around the technology, comparing it to laser scanning. We kind of said okay. Terrestrial LIDAR scanning is the standard. It's an accepted technology. It's kind of the you know best in class, regardless of manufacturer. They all provide very dense, accurate uh, point clouds. And so we we said, okay, we're going to compare to uh, you know those technologies. And for the captures that we're doing, um, you know, especially you look at something like this, a confined small space the accuracies are in the range that we would see from a terrestrial LIDAR scanner. We would never scan, you know, a hundred thousand square foot warehouse, you know, or, or manufacturing facility um, with an iPhone. It just doesn't make sense, um, you know, from a technology standpoint, but for certain things, you absolutely can get uh, accuracies and point cloud densities on par uh, with, with other devices. Sorry, I was gonna say it made a lot of sense to put the the phone or the iPad in the toolbox as a as an option for us to use for capturing these things. It's a very interesting point because, as you know, like a lot of times, like for example, in my world, in the forensics world, and probably probably in yours too, there's sometimes this discussion about accuracy, right? And and it's like how much is it is enough, and you know whether or not an instrument is sufficient or whatever. And for most things, you know you know, down to the millimeter is not required, right? Like uh, for a lot of stuff, it's about, you know, roughly where is something positioned, how is it oriented or something like that. And so, yeah, I think, I think the mobile devices, like you're saying, the, the accuracy is sufficient, especially over the smaller scale. I think that's a really good point. And you also mentioned the, the study, you guys did like a white paper. Um, is, is that paper available on your website? Yeah, it, it is um, on on the VT scans website. Um, uh, if you go to the the 360 capture page, which really highlights the app um, and, and and technology we're using, there's an option if you scroll down there to to download that white paper. It's yep, exactly. And so it you know it goes through uh, the analysis we used. Uh, um, we compared to uh, various different technologies from different manufacturers. We also compared to some known um objects in a terrestrial lidar calibration lab so it wasn't just against other technology and you know what what uh, a different laser scanner was saying the distance was we had some known values as well um that that get used to calibrate things and so we we uh we did the study against that um we tried to simulate you know tech uh, capture in the real world when we created 360 capture the app itself, we actually, and, and uh, it sounds a little bit strange, but we, we kind of, we profiled the hungover construction worker. And, and we did that from the sense of if we could get someone who doesn't want to be at work today, effectively capture something and get good data out the back end, then we, we felt like we had a, a decent tool. And so, you know, uh, kind of, you know, not taking your time, rushing through a site, those kind of things. We did a lot of testing, you know, kind of the, with those methodologies as well as just kind of being really diligent. And the interesting thing was we didn't see a ton of difference in the accuracy uh, because of, of um, you know, how we're, we're combining the, the LiDAR AR kit information from the iPhone and the iPad and photogrammetry using that fusion processing. It, it really ensures that the data out the back end is um, pr pretty good. 
Yeah. And really I mean, good, actually. yeah, I don't want to oversimplify it too much, but I mean, like, um, th- there is some technique involved, obviously, like in the capture, but, but yep. it's not difficult. And if you follow some basic rules, you end up with fairly good data, even for, like you said, the, 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 the hungover, <laughs> hungover construction worker. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, you know, one of the things that is really interesting, Eugene, and I, I, I think this is again, kind of, goes to the form factor and and you probably have seen this too you know when you're scanning with a laser scanner you're planning the project on where you're gonna set up the scanner um, to capture that location and a lot of times you're going into that thinking what's the minimum number of setups i can do to capture this site effectively and because we're putting the device in the hands of someone and you actually have to walk around the site and the object that mentality goes out the window. It's, I need to walk around everything. I need to see everything. And so just because kind of the form factor of a phone or an iPad and that requirement to move around everything in your environment, it ensures that we capture it. We're capturing it at a closer range. Uh, We get less shadows uh, or, you know, LIDAR um, uh, blind spots or, or, or voids. Um, and so it's not so much that, we, you know, there's this revolutionary new technology. It's just kind of changing the form factor and how we're asking someone to capture that lends itself to also, you know, getting more and better data out the back end. Yeah, I noticed in the video and I'll see if I can bring it up here again. But like you've got uh, you've got a guy here who's like, for example, just using a, a, like a selfie stick, a pole or a monopod. And then here they've got here. It looks like they've got the iPad uh, going here. So um, are you are you like putting kits together for people and saying, you know, this is you know, you can use this or you're going out and you've got some some specially designed brackets and things like that. Like, And uh, we, we were talking just before, but um do you have any special equipment that you've made for the iPad or the iPhone? Yeah. So it, it doesn't require it, you know, something like a selfie stick or a standard selfie stick works really well. Yeah. Especially, you know, in this instance, just to get up a little bit higher and see some of that stuff um, uh, on the antenna. If you pause here real quick, this is an interesting application here. We actually 3d printed a bracket for the phone uh, with a couple of lights on it. And so you know, just to be able to mount that on the end of an, a standard extension pole that you can get at a, you know, any uh, kind of hardware store, um, and and you know, be able to drop that in with the lighting. So you know, there are a couple of you know creative solutions that we've looked at to try to aid, um, but it doesn't require it. You know, again, um, you know, if if you can see uh, what it is you're capturing you know, kind of, you know, thinking about it as taking video, um, you're going to get good data out the back end. So we d- typically don't, you know, provide a kit uh, for, for customers that are using 360 capture. They have their own phones or, or iPads and um, they're kind of doing, doing their own thing. Um, it's meant to be pretty, um, pretty generic in that sense. It doesn't require any specialty equipment to work. Okay. What, what do you guys end up doing with the data? Like, is it just you capture, you're going to give that to the customer or do you do like, are you doing work with it, creating some kind of deliverable from that? And then, you know, what kinds of things do you do? Yeah. So our, uh, when we, we look at the 360 capture app, we do have a portal that's, um, tied to it. So the data, we, you know, in addition to the 3D information, we take a lot of photographs in um, in documenting, you know, telecom sites as an example. Um, we might be required to take upwards of 200 photographs of different pieces of equipment, um, serial serialized tags, you know, just kind of as an inventory. Um, so all of that data, the photos that we take and the 3D end up in the portal. The portal is also set up... Um, to help, you know, kind of from a capture management perspective, the app itself, um, along with capturing photos and the three-dimensional information, we also provide a lot of uh, scheduling information about the site someone's going to. So you think about a scan tech that maybe has four sites scheduled, um, you know, we're interfacing with the maps program on there so they can navigate from project site to project site, local contact information, you know, who the building superintendent is, owner, uh, maybe there's 
access codes to get into the building or onto the roof or whatever that looks like. So we've really tried to build the app to set the scan tech up for success with all the information they need about the project or job they're going to do. And so the portal uh, allows you to be able to do all that. But we're hyper-focused on that capture, right? So we get the data, the photographs into the portal, um, and then customers and, and clients can access that and download it. It's their data. Download a standard E57 file that works in a lot of different CAD environments. You know, you, you, we're, we're focused on telecom. We're integrated with Bentley and their open tower platform. So the point cloud data goes into there and you can use all of their tools to analyze structural analysis of the tower or, or um, information about what equipment's on site. They do some really cool things with AI, auto identifying antennas, their size, orientation, those kinds of things. Um, and so it's, yeah, we're, we're kind of, we want to be that enabler. We want to enable really cool things with the technology, the digital twin point cloud information um, and virtualize those workflows for customers. Um, I don't know how much you can say, but I'm just going to ask you, but what, what is next for you guys? Like what, what kinds of things are you looking at implementing or doing with, you know, the, these, these, all these, and not just the mobile app, but I mean, I just, all the different technologies like going forward, are, are you looking at developing the online platform more? Are you looking at doing more with the app? Like what kinds of things can you tell me? Yeah, I think, you know, the biggest focus and, and what we hear from customers is some of this AI functionality, kind of trying to pull that forward um, um, first into the portal. And so if I get my data out of the field, say, you know, you were you were showing the video of that array on the rooftop, give me a quick inventory of what what's actually there. You know, th that's what we're seeing customers. They don't necessarily... Um, want the 3D data. They want the information associated with it, right? And so if we can start to pull that information forward where they can just say, uh, tell me how many antennas are on this site and I get that information quickly. We want to do that in, in the portal environment. And then we're actually looking at pulling that even into the field, right? So bring some of that core technology where I can bring that uh, device out in the field and it tells me um, kind of in real time what is it that I'm looking at? Um, you know, what what's the make, model, and serial number maybe of of the piece of equipment that I'm working on? Um, so I, I think that's where we're focused now that we've got this capture down. You know, it was really important um, to to start with really good data from for these AI engines to work. And it's not just about the imagery; it's also about having good, clean 3D data to understand you know, different sizes and, and, um, characteristics of, of what you're looking at. Yeah, no, I think it's a really great point. I know from my side, um, and I think that's probably the next sort of generation of what's going to happen is, you know, we've, we're, we've gotten really good at capturing a lot of data, but a lot of the analysis has been very manual, right? So that's in it, you know, historically. So now I think you're, you're right. Like being able to look into the data, the video and the 3D data and now get context and try to understand what's there, you know, what's actually, what, what is it actually looking at? Uh, how many quantities, sizes, like you're saying, I think that's, that's probably the next, just that basic stuff is already like extremely helpful. Um, even in the, like, for example, in the crime scene world, what if, you know, you could send in the video and all of a sudden it detects all your evidence markers, the type of evidence where there's blood, where there's cartridge cases, where there's, you know, that's, that's pretty, that's very powerful uh, stuff. So yeah, I can see from your side, uh, how it can be super efficient doing something like that. And, and the information would be, uh, you know, very helpful. Well, we're, what we're starting to see is more and more, um, people like in, in involved in the process that are, aren't 3d technical people interacting or engaging with it. So it's almost like getting to a point where it's that question and answer. Like, let me ask a question about this virtual site that I'm looking at and then, you know, spit back the information that I want. I don't want to have to be able to cross section it and cut through it and, you know, navigate through, um, know how to use the 3D tools to go find that. It's great that we can do that and we're virtualizing those workflows, right? People don't actually have to be there at that particular moment in time on the site. So it's kind of this virtual workflow that we're enabling for those that are really good at that. But that next step is, you know, someone from a risk or security perspective or 
uh, of someone with a financial background trying to understand how many pieces of equipment it actually takes to to set up a site or whatever. They just want to query that data and get their information back. And I think that's where we're going to see this this uh, the, the idea of AI machine learning um, really take off when it comes to um, 3D digital twins and extracting really good information out of it. Yeah, I can't help but state the obvious, even though we're in different, completely different sort of areas focused and in, you know, these different industries or whatever, the problems are the same and the need is exactly the same, right? So really, really interesting that we, you know, we're sort of doing the same thing in sort of different fields. So, well, look, John, that's awesome. I, I think, uh, you know, I, I like what I'm seeing and, and uh, you know, some of the examples you've been posting, the white paper and everything else, super helpful. So uh, yeah, I'll put some links down in the video for people to have a look and hey, man, thanks. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I really appreciate the time. And we love what you're doing, Eugene. It's it's awesome. You know, we're trying to, like you said, expand the toolbox, different use cases. Um, and um, yeah, we're, we're, we're trying to solve the same problem just with different users. So whatever we can do to help, uh, we're here and great job and everything that you're doing to, to promote the use of, you know, kind of the mobile device as a, a real tool in the toolbox as we're trying to you know, create these digital twins of these different assets. Awesome. Thanks, John. All right. Thank you.